Everything in MySQL is an index. InnoDB, which is the main storage engine of MySQL, uses an index to organize the data in the tables. This index is based on the primary key. When we work with index organized table as the one in MySQL, the choice of the primary index is very important. The primary key can impact the ratio between random and sequential I.O., the size of secondary indexes, and how many pages need to be read into the buffer pool. The primary key for InnoDB tables is always a B3 index. In this section, we're going to understand why an optimal primary key is as small as possible, keeps increasing monotonically, and groups the rows we query frequently and within short distance of each other. As mentioned, MySQL uses an index to organize the data in the tables. The index is called the clustered index and the name comes from the fact that index values are clustered together. Here, we see how records are laid out in a clustered manner. Notice that the leaf pages contain full rows, but the node pages contain only the indexed columns. By default, InnoDB uses the primary key for the clustered index. If you don't define a primary key, InnoDB will try to use a unique non-nullable index instead, and if there is no such index, InnoDB will define a hidden primary key for you and then cluster on that. A clustering primary key can help performance, but it can also cause serious performance problems. Thus, we should think carefully about clustering, especially when we change a table storage engine from InnoDB to something else or vice versa. Let's see which are the benefits that can boost performance tremendously if we consider the primary key and the clustering properties. First. Any secondary index access requires two index lookups instead of one. This point can be a bit confusing. First, a secondary index is any other index that's not a primary key. Then, why would a secondary index require two index lookups to find any value we are looking for? As an example, consider this query. Select username from, from user info where email is equal to some value. Imagine that we have a secondary index on the email column. In this case, to access the username, MySQL first searches the secondary index to find which is the primary key for the given email. Then, with the primary key, the storage engine navigates the primary index and searches for the actual row which has the values we are looking for. Remember, a leaf node in the secondary index doesn't store a pointer to the reference row physical location. Rather, it stores the row's primary key values. Therefore, choosing a large primary key will also have an impact on the size of every other index, since the primary key values are stored in all other secondary indexes. MySQL and most databases store the data in fixed size pages. Because we keep related data close together, we can fetch more data by reading less pages. For example, when implementing a mailbox, you can cluster by user ID, so you can retrieve all messages of a single user by fetching only a few pages from disk. If you didn't use clustering, each message might require its own disk I.O. Keeping the data closely together will also make data access fast for joins and for lookups when using the primary key. A clustered index holds both the index and the data together in one B3, so retrieving the rows from it is normally faster than a comparable lookup in a non-clustered index. On the downside, if the tables are not designed to take advantage of the clustered index's properties, some drawbacks can appear. For instance, when new rows are inserted or when the primary key is updated, Tables built upon clustered index are subject to page split. A page split happens when a row key value dictates that the row must be placed into a page that is full of data. So the storage engine must split the page into two to accommodate the new row. This kind of page split can cause a table to use more space on disk than necessary. Similarly, the speed of inserts depends heavily on insertion order. Inserting rows in primary key order 
is the fastest way to load data into an InnoDB table. We'll see a benchmark example later in this section. If you didn't load the rows in primary key order, then it might be a good idea to reorganize the table with optimized table close after loading a lot of data. This way, table fragmentation is removed. Keep in mind that clustering gives the largest improvement for IO bound workloads. If the data fits into memory, the order in which it's accessed doesn't really matter. So clustering doesn't give much benefit in this case. If you are using InnoDB and you don't need any particular clustering, it can be a good idea to define a surrogate key, which is a primary key whose values are not derived from your application data. The easiest way to do this is usually with an auto increment column. This will ensure that rows are inserted in sequential order and will offer better performance for joins using the primary keys. It's best to avoid random or non-sequential clustering keys, especially for IO bounds workloads. For example, using UUID values is a poor choice from a performance standpoint because it makes clustered index insertion random, which is the worst case scenario and doesn't give you any helpful data clustering. To demonstrate, we'll benchmark two cases. First, we'll create two identical tables except for the type of the primary key. The first table called user info has an integer ID as primary key defined as follow. You can find the code in the description. Notice here the auto incrementing integer. The rest of the attributes are just fill up columns. For the second case, we have a table named user info underscore UUID. This table is identical to the user info table, except that the primary key is an UUID column instead of an integer. Now we will insert a million records into each table. To do that, we'll use a Python script which inserts the necessary number of dummy rows. Finally, we'll measure the time for execution. To insert 1 million rows into the UUID table, it took with 210 more seconds than the integer auto incremented version. Not only that, but the resulting indexes are a bit larger. Some of that is due to the larger primary key, but some of it is for sure due to the pay splits and resultant fragmentation as well. To see why it is like this, let's quickly check what happens in the index when we insert data into the first table. Here, we notice that inserts are filling up a page and then continuing on the second page. InnoDB stores each record immediately after the one before because the primary key values are sequential. When the page reaches its maximum fill factor, which by default is 15 out of 16 full, the next record goes into a new page. It is only 15 to leave room for later modifications. Once the data have been loaded in this sequential order, the primary key pages are packed nearly full with in-order records, which is highly desirable. Contrast that with what happens when we insert the data into the second table, the one with UUID clustered index. Because each new record doesn't necessarily have a larger primary key value than the previous one, InnoDB cannot always place the new row at the end of the index. It has to find the appropriate place for the row, on average, somewhere near the middle of the existing data and make room for it. This causes a lot of extra work and results in a suboptimal data layout. Here is a summary of the drawbacks. When insertions are done out of order, InnoDB has to split pages frequently to make room for new rows. This requires moving around a lot of data. Pages become sparsely and irregularly filled because of splitting, so the final data is fragmented. Also, the destination page 
might have been flashed to disk and removed from the caches, or might not have been ever placed into the caches because the pages are randomly picked. In this case, InnoDB will have to find the page and read it from disk before it can insert the new row, and this causes a lot of random I.O. After loading such random values into the clustered index, you should probably do optimize table to rebuild the table and fill the pages optimally. The moral of the story is that you should strive to insert data in primary key order when using InnoDB, and you should try to use a clustering key that gives a monotonically increasing value for each new row. In practice, it may not be possible to fulfill all primary key conditions, in which case we need to make the best possible compromise. For many workloads, an auto-incrementing unsigned integer, either int or big int, depending on the number of rows that are expected for the table, is a good choice. However, there may be special consideration, such as requirements for uniqueness across multiple MySQL instances. The most important feature of the primary key is that it should be as sequential as possible. If you don't utilize a user-defined primary key, then we get automatically a hidden key. Here, we may think that the hidden primary key may be a good choice for the clustered index as any other column. After all, it is an auto-incrementing integer. However, there are two major drawbacks of the hidden key. It only identifies the row for the local MySQL instance and the counter is global to all InnoDB tables in the current DB instance. The fact that the hidden key is only useful locally means that in a replication, the hidden value can't be used to identify which row to update on replicas. And the fact that the counter is global means that it can become a point of contention and cause performance degradation when inserting data. The bottom line is that you should always explicitly define what you want as primary key. For secondary indexes, there are more choices, and this will be discussed in another section.